Um, hello and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Intro to Spring Boot. Um, I will assume that uh, if you're here you generally don't know that much about Spring Boot. Um, my goal is to provide a little bit of background and context uh, so that you, you can understand my, my personal perspective as a Java developer, um, the way that you know, we, we write applications for, for some time. For me, it was interesting to actually describe um, what Spring Boot is and what is the value that it brings on top of what you're typically used to doing and what we're used to doing for a long time. And I've been around uh, Spring uh, both as a committer and before that as a uh, consultant uh, for, for quite some time. So I saw it you know, happen firsthand and I can uh, provide uh, some context and insight. Um, so we will do a little bit of code. I will definitely show um, some hands-on stuff, but uh, the, the purpose here is more to, to give you an, an idea to understand what Spring Boot is about and what's special about it. And then um, hopefully you will see that it's actually relatively transparent and um, that that's the whole point of it it's not meant to it looks like magic but the whole point is that it should be um, easy to to work with so I'll talk about those things so I mean traditionally uh, for a Java developer the learning curve um, has been kind of very high or the getting started experience with writing creating project has been very high and it's almost a kind of source of pride, you know, hey, I can do this, you know. Um, and if you can't, that means that you're not a proper Java enterprise developer, right? You, you, you're, you know, one of those uh, front-end developers or, you know, somebody who doesn't um, know as much as we do. Um, so we kind of take pride in this uh, pain. Um, of course, those were different times and, you know, we didn't have to write applications or as many applications. Um, and we kind of knew this was a problem, but that's where we were. And we watched other languages and platforms deal with this, um, in particular uh, Ruby on Rails, um, you know, this kind of getting started experience, develop a Twitter application in 45 minutes during a demo. And, you know, we look at it and we're kind of, okay, this is really cool, but it will never work for the kinds of applications that I'm building because they're Java enterprise applications, right? They're serious apps. Um, these are just toy applications. So you got Ruby on Rails, of course. Um, but one thing is that over time, um, as applications become more, more complex, also productivity uh, grows in importance together with that. Uh, so the ability to actually achieve things and to achieve them fast uh, became more important over time because what we do is more complex to begin with. Um, you know, the web has expanded tremendously the kinds of things that we do. And also, um, what happens over time is that we have uh, new developers coming on the scene and they don't have the same background that we do going back to Servlet 1.0 when we learned and then we saw JSPs come along and you know the whole scene evolve. Um, and as new people come along, they don't care about that history. They see all the other stuff um, you know, that helps them to develop really fast. And uh, they look to Java and a lot of the things that we say just doesn't make sense to them. And, and so there is that perspective as well, uh, that the bar, if the bar is too high for new people joining, uh, that's definitely a problem. <clears throat> now, it's not that there aren't any attempts to replicate that experience in Java. Um, so you can go quite far back, um, something like Grails uh, did it the groovy way. Uh, the whole idea with Grails is that you have the Ruby on Rails experience with the groovy language uh, that has enough features to provide DSLs and all kinds of um, ways to do things fast. And, um, and so we had that and also uh, there's things like the Play Framework that did it in Java. Of course, since then, you know, version two, they've reworked it significantly in Scala. Um, and so those attempts exist. Um, now, when you think about the Spring Framework, so where was the Spring Framework in all of this? Um, with Spring, I mean, from the very beginning, it, it was created as a framework that um, exists around Java E in that ecosystem to complement what you can do with Java E, to make it easier to reduce boilerplate code, to introduce um, intuitive defaults, and to provide um, a good experience in that sense. So um, 
a question that I've encountered uh, before is, um, well, if Spring is to make uh, Java developers life easy, why do we need Spring Boot, you know, to make Spring Framework easy? Um, well, the point is that Spring Boot is not about making using the Spring Framework easy. The point is that the Spring Framework's original goal um, is basically within um, an ecosystem, Java EE, and especially if you, th if you think about going back to 2003 when Spring Framework came around, you have a, an, an application server deployment model. Um, you have um, a certain way that you deploy things. You have, um, you're dealing with third-party library choices. Those are all things that are generally outside of the scope and the realm that, that Spring has traditionally dealt with. Um, you know, it, it, it took it from there. So you've got your Tomcat server, you've got your server API, and then from there, Spring helps you to get started. But, you know, you kind of need that experience, uh, that foundation uh, to begin with. So there's a lot of things that just weren't ever goals for the Spring framework, and they were outside of reach. Now, there were attempts to build such things within the Spring ecosystem as well. Um, some of you may remember uh, the DM server. <laughs> Um, thing um, that goes back quite a while now. Um, there, there was uh, and there is still a project called Spring Roo uh, that focused a lot on code generation, you know. Um, and um, so that's the general background, the general context in which uh, things are happening here. In the meantime, uh, we also uh, see something much simpler come along on the scene, and that's the rise of the full stack Java frameworks like Drop Wizard and others. So the idea is very simple. Um, instead of you know, going out and choosing everything that you need to start building web applications, um, because that's the Java way, right? There's a lot of choices and a lot of libraries. How about if we put together all the things that you need to call it a web application, the most like, meaningful choices that I can make, for example, and um, we will provide an easy path for you to get started, and we'll make sure you get to production as quickly as possible. Um, with as little uh, as possible to do. Very simple idea, very straightforward idea, and you can assemble your own stack, just make it easy to get started. Um, and um, interesting story um, is that, um, in fact, I will show you the original ticket. So Spring Boot, I don't know how many of you know this, uh, but Spring Boot originally started at a conference like this one, um, Spring One conference in 2012, um, a guy called Mike Youngstrom, uh, during a me um, one of these birds of a feather sessions, said the things that he described here, where he basically said, "Hey, you know, the um, enterprise development la landscape is is growing quite rapidly," and he basically went on and made a case about these um, full stack frameworks and how when they have new developers joining their company, you know, they kind of see those other, you know, platforms and things and what can be done in there. And, and, and he knows that Spring has quite a, a bit to offer, but it's just not packaged in the same way. So he's basically saying, couldn't you do a, you know, full stack framework that's assembling a Spring stack, you know, all the things that Spring has to offer. We know that's very powerful, so why can't you do that? And this, this was created, this ticket was created soon after uh, the conference on October 17th, 2012. And you can see a little bit below uh, Phil Webb, who is the project lead uh, for Spring Boot. Uh, he's basically describing short message. Rather than fix this in the Spring framework, we have decided to start a new project called Spring Boot. And this is uh, less than a year later. And here is the GitHub repository. Here is the blog post. And then I would like to thank you. Great, I'm excited to see how Spring Boot looks. That's a happy user. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great story, I think, you know, that um, to think that, you know, sometimes people say, well, how much influence can a user have, you know, who is not sending pull requests or doing actual work? Tremendous amount of impact if you just look at this one ticket. Of course, you know, it can vary quite a bit on a scale from very little reports to something like this, but occasionally something like this happens too. So yes, we can do that, and that's how Spring Boot was created. Um, and uh, let's see, so this started at Spring 1 2012, uh, then the Spring IO website was uh, which at the time was running, I think, something with PHP, was recreated uh, using Spring Boot. 
and that was actually a collaboration with Pivotal Labs um, and Spring Engineering. Uh, so Pivotal Labs, for those of you who don't know, they're part of the Pivotal organization. They're a consulting, famous agile consulting firm, and they've been using Ruby on Rails forever. So kind of an interesting <laughs> side story on its own. Uh, because they used to use Java, you know, back in 2006, and then they started using Ruby, they never looked back. So fast forward, we're part of the same company, and, um, and you know, this collaboration to launch Spring.io on Spring Boot with Pivotal Labs Engineering was an interesting experiment because you're taking Ruby on Rails developers who have, you know, their standards for what you can do with Ruby and let's see, can you do that with Java? And their initial experience was very, very pleased. Um, I mean, of course, it's not an easy transition, um, never is when you're making such a switch because there's a language underneath and all that. Um, nevertheless, this, you know, was a good early indication of where this is going. Uh, so it was very promising from the start, but the levels of adoption, you know, from there, uh, it was just, you know, surprised everybody. It's just astonishing. Um, clearly, when you create something at the right time, which really solves problems that are real problems, um, it's like a wave that just carries you and um, you, you go farther than you expected. So um, to take, for example, Grails, um, they almost right away uh, rebuilt uh, their internals. So you could say that's probably not a coincidence. They were probably looking for an opportunity to do something like that. Uh, they had a bunch of issues, but when they saw what they can get from Spring Boot, they basically jumped on it immediately. Um, this is a graph of downloads uh, for the year 2016. The numbers are very small because the idea is that you don't want to look at the overall numbers. They're not so meaningful. What's meaningful is the trend, uh, how the downloads are happening. Uh, and you can see clearly that the trend is, um, this is just over the span of one year. And if you see over multiple years, it's a tremendous amount of growth. <clears throat> so what's the big deal? Um, well, I mean, for once, um, you can create a runnable server application in a tweet. And you can see that uh, tweet. And there were further suggestions to reduce one more line because you can make it rest controller and remove response body. Uh, so it can be even shorter than that. Uh, but basically, you take this um, and you can run it with nothing else, um, just with uh, Groovy and uh, from the command line, and that downloads everything it needs. It's opinionated. Spring Boot has opinions because you know the philosophy in the Spring Framework has always been you have full flexibility to do things. We we try to do a few things, but we're not going to assume how you want to build apps. But that leaves a lot of room for uh, somebody or something to come along and to say, well, that's all good that I can do it, but how about give me an easy getting started experience, and then if I need flexibility, I will take advantage of that. Um, but it's a difficult balance to strike, but we will see why Boot um, does it quite well. Uh, philosophically, there's absolutely no code generation. This is a substantial difference between Spring Root, that was a previous attempt uh, to achieve something like this, and Spring Boot. Um, we do not attempt to uh, pre-generate code that you then have to somehow maintain, which, of course, in a language like Groovy is easy to adapt to. Um, uh, but with Java, you have to go through hoops to actually continuously maintain that generated code, which is, um, you know, Spring Roo uses, um, in particular, um, AspectJ. Um, uh, so there's no code generation, but nevertheless, it provides very useful uh, things, uh, the, the things that actually matter, and then gets out of your way so you can write the code. Um, and it also focuses on features in all phases of development. So it's not just for um, getting started, but it's also for production features. So um, how does a tweetable app like that actually work? What's, um, what makes it tick? So let's go ahead and uh, go to... Um, start.spring.io. Uh, so this is a website where you can generate an initial project. Um, so I'm just going to say generate. And that gives me a demo zip, which I'm going to extract. And now I'm going to open that. in my ID. And if I go here, 
Okay, so what do I have at the moment? Uh, this is what I have. I have a Maven Palm, I have an application Java uh, class, um, and if we look at that demo application class, it has a main uh, function, so that pro uh, promises that I can run this. Uh, so I'll go ahead and run it. Um, but it exits right away, it prints a, a nice logo, uh, which is clearly very important. <laughs> um, uh, but it also exits because there's really nothing else um, in the application. Um, so the reason why I'm starting so basic is because I want to make the point that um, when you start with Spring Boot, um, it gives you certain basics, um, but you don't have to necessarily run it as a web application. You can create any application out of that. Um, so what's nice about this, if we say uh, Maven package, And if we take a look at the target directory, you'll see that there are two jars. Uh, one of them is the original jar. So this is what you would normally expect. You know, that's the, the classes and the resources. Uh, but then there is an actual um, jar that we can use, and that's what you, uh, we call a runnable jar. Um, and you will see that the actual classes here are uh, bootloader classes. Uh, then we have a meta inf directory, and in that, uh, there is a, uh, the demo application is the start class, okay? Um, and then the actual classes, uh, what's interesting here is that all the jars uh, are kind of bundled uh, together with this thing. So uh, that means that what I can do is I can say java-jar and then target uh, demo and there I'm running the thing. And the reason why this is possible, uh, how this happened, is because we have, let me close this one. Uh, okay, and um, in the Maven Palm, you will see that there is a, um, a Spring Boot Maven plugin, which does all the work to kind of package things together, and then gives you an executable jar, which is, which is a really nice thing because, um, um, it's 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 a thing which is hard to explain to anybody who is not involved in Java. You know, you got this project and you got all these jars, but you got to assemble it. The way to run it is is actually not easy. And then traditionally you deploy it into an application server. Um, but um, doing it like this, basically, it's all bundled together and it's simple as Java dash jar, which makes the development experience incredibly pleasant because um, you know I don't need to uh, depend on a web plugin for my IDE. Things that are always been sources of issues for me. <laughs> Something doesn't work with Maven, with Gradle and the, the web. Um, all I have to do is just basically right click this and run it just like a simple um, Java app and it, and it just works. I can debug it. Um, from the command line I can do java-jar or I can also do Maven Spring Boot. So just run it through the Spring Boot plugin. And again that runs the application. So that's cool. So we're up uh, with um, minimal effort here. Okay, so we have an executable jar. Um, there are Spring uh, Boot Maven and Gradle plugins that help us to do this. Uh, we use the Maven package command and then uh, that will give us uh, that executable jar. Um, this is the way that command line Java should be, I would argue. I mean, that's a much nicer experience and makes a lot of sense. Um, it doesn't require any um, you know, class path um, management or scripts. Uh, it's already described in your, in your build file, so you shouldn't have to you know, um, re-specify that. It's also very cloud friendly, mean, means you just have a jar and you can you know, push that jar to um, a cloud environment and that's all it needs to know. Okay, um, so uh, to do something a little bit more useful, we can select the web dependency. Uh, so if I go back to uh, here, I can type uh, something like web, and you can see here that it's showing me a selected dependency. I can type security uh, like that. Um, so I can keep adding things and then generate, but let's not do it all over again. We can just go into the Maven Palm here. 
Um, and instead of the basic Spring Boot starter, I'm just going to type uh, here Spring Boot Web, uh, Spring Boot Starter Web, and then uh, let's import those changes. Okay, so what do we have this time? So now if I say um, Maven Spring Boot Run, I'm starting up again. This time uh, the application doesn't exit because we are actually running with Tomcat and um, we're on port 8080. So, port 80. Uh, of course, we don't have there um, anything there yet. Um, Right, so what we get now is, is basically a web application jar. It's like a war, uh, but it's executable. You can right-click this in the IDE, you can run it. Uh, don't need web plugins or just java-jar. Or if you use Spring Boot with the run uh, com from the command line that gives you um, uh, runs in exploded format, uh, the equivalent of exploded format. Question? Yeah. Um, so here I'm using uh, Spring Boot 153, which is the current production release, um, and we're going to talk about the runtime support in a moment. But that's uh, by default that's running with Tomcat. Yeah, it's the uh, so if I do the reactive support, you will see that's not here. Uh, but if I switch to Boot 2 snapshots or the first milestone, if I type reactive, there's now a reactive web starter. And that's the thing which runs with Netty out of the box. Uh, right. So, um, OK, so um, this is a big part of the story. Um, essentially, uh, one of the things that's happened over time is that the importance of deploying into a container in a traditional way uh, has diminished and the appeal of actually doing this in embedded style has grown uh, because it enables us to do things like that. It means that, um, you know, we just do java-jar and we start and suddenly, you know, I have a Tomcat instance running with everything um, in it and it's an incredibly um, a better experience. Um, uh, so th that's definitely kind of a big trend. Instead of pushing apps into an app server, you can now basically prepare an app and that app has everything in it and you can just push that app to, to a cloud or to anything of that, of that nature. Um, now, if you want to run with a war uh, because you're running in an application server which requires a war um, or is not embeddable, uh, you can certainly do that. Um, you would simply go into your Maven POM and change the packaging from jar to war and that will produce a war and then you can push that into your um, app server. So that choice is still there. Uh, right, so starter palms. Um, so let's continue to look at what is uh, special here uh, about Spring Boot. So if we look at our Maven dependencies, um, so typically uh, one of the things that we have to do uh, to develop a web application is we have to go choose all the frameworks that we want to use. We want something for JSON, we want a um, you know, application server, we want, um, you know, all kinds of dependencies that we need to assemble. With Spring Boot, you have the concept of these um, starter palms uh, that essentially are um, kind of, you know, easy entry points into a whole bunch of dependencies that give you a certain kind of functionality. So if we take a look at what's, uh, what we have here, Uh, for dependencies, uh, so we depend primarily on uh, Spring Boot Starter Web, and Spring Boot Starter Web, uh, we also have a parent over here. We have a parent POM, and that parent POM brings um, curated versions of all the dependencies. This is why in this POM you will not see any explicit dependency management. You can change the versions. Uh, but this is a big deal, like dealing with dependencies and dealing with <coughs> versions is something that is not easy because you have to, you know, kind of assemble the right versions um, and also pick your libraries. Uh, but by using the Spring Boot Starter Web, um, you're essentially saying, I want to develop web applications, give me the dependencies that I'd like, 
uh, the, the minimum dependencies that I would need to do something meaningful. And we will give you with an opinion what those dependencies are. You can deviate from them, but this is what we think is a reasonable starting point. Um, and um, that, that proves to be very powerful. So what, what you have here, uh, what this brings in, um, you have the auto configuration. Those are things that Spring Boot provides. Um, then you have the uh, Tomcat starter by default. Uh, but it's very easy to switch from Tomcat to Jetty uh, or, or um, Undertow by um, essentially a very small change in your POM. So switching between different servers here is quite straightforward. Uh, you get the Tomcat embedded. Um, yes, question? Yeah, is there any downside to um, changing from the suggested dependencies, uh, like for future updates or something like that? Um, no, in fact, it's very much expected. Um, if, if that dependency is within the, the, the realm of um, you know, what Spring Boot integrates with, you would typically get some version. Sometimes you may have a reason to deviate to go to a newer version or, you know, there may be things that you need to do like that. Um, but uh, by, by and large, um, you know, it's expected that if you want extra things that Spring, doesn't, um, Spring Boot doesn't integrate with or if you want to alter, alter the version, it's quite straightforward to go in. Um, for example, if I want to change the version of uh, Tomcat, I don't even have to kind of spell out all the Tomcat dependencies. Um, I need to do something like this, tomcat.version. And because Spring Boot has auto configuration with a POM that defines all the <coughs> dependency versions to begin with, that means that I can easily deviate from that version and provide a different version that I want to use in my application without um, having to respecify. So it's all, it's all made from the start to be opinionated, but then it gets out of your way pretty quickly if you want to change something. But again, one of the big benefits of Spring Boot is that it provides a set of curated versions, um, w which we test, and you get something that you know these versions work together. So like what happens in the event if there's like conflicts? Like so you have Spring Boot starter web, but what, what happens if I import a, or change a class or change it to a library that's, uh, that has a conflict with it? Does that become a big problem, or is it? Uh, um, not any, not any bigger than it normally is. I mean, when you have, um, that's exactly what this um, uh, alleviates. Is it deals with these kinds of dependency management issues because um, you um, essentially are dealing with pre-selected uh, versions. When you start using your own versions, of course, uh, you can sometimes run into into issues with uh, clashes. But I mean, that's that's no different than doing anything in Java. This just takes you further along. Um, it's not at all unique to Spring Boot. No, in fact, Spring Boot actually uh, solves much of this problem by, by you know, testing out. Uh, there's also the Spring I.O. platform. Um, so if you want like more stable versions, um, there, there is a, so Spring Boot moves relatively fast and upgrades versions, uh, but then there's also the Spring I.O. platform. Uh, which is a, a huge effort to take all the Spring projects and all of the dependencies that they provide and then to, to give you versions of that Spring IO platform that says, here is a set of curated versions that all projects should work with and uh, you can safely, like you can import the bombs of this thing and then it will just suggest all the versions for you. So these are kind of dependency management issues that um, if we didn't solve this in some way, then you are left to go figure out, you know, all the details of what versions work together with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we get is we get Tomcat, uh, we get Hibernate Validator, we get uh, Jackson for JSON, uh, we get Spring MVC, and then the rest of it is for testing purposes. So just a very minimal stack, which means that um, I can go here into my demo application and I can say uh, rest controller. And yeah, if, um, I mean, obviously in a real application, you wouldn't you know, do this straight in, in, a, in an application that's main, but it's kind of cool that you can do that. Uh, so let's, Say we're gonna take a request param. 
name and we're gonna say hello name okay um, so let's run this Host test name Apache Con. Hello, Apache Con. Okay, um, so I mean, that's that's cool. Uh, let's take a look briefly here what we actually got for the response. Right, so we just got plain text here because we're returning a string, and by default, um, <coughs> Uh, we basically treat string as a return value as something to be rendered as is and we render it as text but if this was an object it would become JSON so you would have JSON rendering um, out of the box um, so that's kind of the getting started experience really effortless and really easy to uh, to run that um, and these starter palms uh, there's a, a whole variety of these starter palms that you can see here uh, there's a listing um, in, in the documentation. Uh, so typically if you're looking for functionality, so I just did a web application um, because I wanted to get started from that um, that side, but you can then look for other things that you might be interested, you know, whether it's uh, related to data, um, you know, different kinds of integrations in the web layer, um, different kinds of messaging solutions and uh, there, there are these you know basically groupings of things that you might want to do and explore and just drop that in your palm and uh, read about what it provides for auto configuration speaking of auto configuration <coughs> so um, in order to make this work and a, a useful way to think about Spring Boot is if you just took the Spring Framework and you just wanted to create a web application, what would you be doing? So you would be creating some configuration. You would be managing your dependencies, then you would be creating some configuration. So we give those things out of the box uh, to make it um, easy to get started with a kind of meaningful basic um, opinions. Um, and that auto configuration is basically uh, assembling a few things uh, for you so you can be um, up and running. Um, it is not magic, um, so the auto configuration is actually something that you can easily see. Um, so this is, for example, the Spring MVC configuration, and you can look. Um, this is in the auto configure jar, Spring Boot auto configure, and you can see for the various different integrations uh, there are auto configuration classes, and this is Java-based configuration, so you can read it, um, and you can understand. Um, what is doing what it's doing here for example uh, in order for spring mvc configuration to kick in uh, it declares that it's conditional on the presence of these classes we must have the servlet uh, class on the class path which means we have the servlet api we must have the dispatcher servlet which means that you have spring mvc on the class path um, then uh, this is interesting <coughs> because there there must be no web mvc configuration support so this is a class which actually provides Spring MVC configuration. And if it's present, that means that you're defining the, the Spring MVC configuration yourself. So this is kind of, you can begin to see the mechanism in Spring Boot that it backs off. When you start to do things, to declare them yourself, it has that built-in mechanism to back off and just let you do it. Uh, so there are very different levels to which you can take it. You can take over a little bit, you can take over much more, or you can kind of take over all of it. Um, and then you can see uh, that there are different kinds of things being created. So for example, there's a, a hidden HTTP method filter. Uh, this is for when you're submitting a form. And of course, in HTML, you cannot submit anything for, for put. Um, or was it the servlet API that, I think it's the forms uh, that can do it in the browser form. So essentially what you do is you're sending it as a post, but then there's a hidden <coughs> field that says this is actually a put <laughs> and, um, and and so then we wrap the request on the server side so it, it looks like an HTTP put so that way you can do a, a, a delete or put uh, with an HTML form um, so there's a, a variety of things like that and you can basically look at what all the configuration is um, of course it's um, you're not going to 
understand all of that at first, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's all very transparent. You know, it's there. You can see exactly what's being declared. Uh, of course, it's going to take some learning depending on what uh, library is being used. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's easy to jump in and, and figure out, and you can begin to see what you can do to replace it, um, and so on. So it's not magic. Uh, also, there is a deb uh, debug flag. So if we do... So let's do java-jar. <coughs> and then uh, add the debug flag. And then there's an auto configuration report and that tells you all the things that it found, all the matches, and then uh, further down, and you can see, it says, okay, I was looking for the dispatcher servlet auto configuration, uh, and that was conditional on a dispatcher servlet uh, being present. It was found. Um, so it kind of tells you about all these matches, and then underneath that there is also a listing of the things that didn't match, um, and, and you can kind of debug uh, problems like that. So it's pretty easy to see. So in order to get started, you know, that kind of tweetable app, um, you know, you just go to start Spring IO, you download it, and you know, two minutes later you're up and running with a full application doing uh, server-side endpoints. We have uh, first of all, um, the, what is called an executable jar, which bundles all the dependencies together, so you can do java-jar and run it. You have a stack of dependencies that you can very easily say, I want the web starter palm, and that gives you a bunch of dependencies with curated versions. And you have auto configuration that gives you the, um, the basic configuration of those frameworks that we think you need to, to, uh, to be up and running. Um, and and that's, that's what you have for getting started. Any questions so far? What about environment configuration, database connection information, stuff that you wouldn't want in the artifact itself? Um, so, uh, so there are mechanisms for that, and um, the, in the Spring Framework, and Boot exposes uh, that. Uh, there are uh, profiles. The concept of profiles and environments are modeled in Spring Framework configuration, so you can have um, a Java config file for development and then another one for production and you use an annotation at profile on that um, and then you can specify which environment you're running in in one of a variety of different ways. So you can separate your configuration first of all um, and then with, uh, with boot um, also I mean there's a number of ways to specify which environment you're in. Um, they they can be they can be stored externally as well. Yeah, so there are different sources of that configuration. You can um, there's an abstraction for how you pull the um, configuration uh, property source uh, abstraction. It can come from property files. It can come from environment variables. It can come from um, just about anywhere essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was helped to bring the production because hmm. like you can't even stop it. So there is no you know, with Tomcat you have a script which stops the application mm -hmm. you have to do it for everything uh, on dispatch. So are there any you know, intentions to make things more easy to maintain? Um, I mean, it's by all means intended for running in production, um, and it has features for running in production. I don't know what you mean by there's no way to stop it because just a simple Java dash jar. Yeah, you um, have to kill it. If yeah. you kill it, you have to find it. So, for example, mm. comes with a script which tries to shut down gracefully and mm -hmm. kill it if everything fails. Yeah, so it's still a graceful shutdown depending on the signal that you use. Um, and I believe there's. Um, you will see that there's um, um, management uh, actuator endpoints, and you can manage it through that. It's by all means meant for running in production. If you run into issues like that and you think Spring Boot is not ready for production, take a step back and file a ticket or open a question somewhere because chances are you know, there's an answer to what you're asking, or if not, it is intended to be like that in production. So 
if something is missing, um, it will be added. It's not a kind of a toy that's the next thing that I'm going to go into. It's not something that's meant to, to make it easy to start and then from there, you know, you figure it out. It's meant to be um, for production use. And a lot of people are running with it in production. Any, anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you might have it in the next slide, but just uh, so is there a way we can like, have existing application to wrap it in Spring Boot? Uh, do I have to wrap the source code, or can I, can I just take the war and wrap it in Spring Boot? Hmm. Um, yeah. So um, with an existing application. Um, you, I mean, based on uh, the things that are listed here, uh, first of all, um, you probably have a Maven, you know, or Gradle file, and you would have to um, kind of switch over at some point to use the um, Spring Boot Maven, you know, configuration. Um, so you have to work that out, which basically means that your Maven file should become a lot smaller, and then you just have to figure out what extra things you need that may not be uh, brought in. Um, and then uh, also the configuration will overlap to some degree. So you have to um, experiment with running with the auto configuration and then see what special features are you enabling. The thing is that, um, again, you can think of Spring Boot as um, you know, the, the Spring engineers kind of sitting down and creating an application the way you would. So they're using the same facilities that are available to you, except they're prepackaging it. So you would compare basically, if you're doing any, if you're configuring Spring MVC in a specific way, then you have to tweak those properties in the Spring Boot configuration the way they're supposed there. But once you go through that process from there, it's your code. I mean, Boot doesn't generate any code. This is what it gives you. You have to go to the source. And what I was thinking is, I like the deployment part of it, where mm -hmm. it Um, because it has yeah, I mean, um, I imagine that if you add the um, the boot plugin, that would be your starting point. That will probably generate your runnable. I haven't actually tried this, um, but I don't see any reason why. You know, if, if you're listing out your dependencies explicitly, it should still be able to generate the the executable jar just the same, and then you can probably reduce those dependencies over time. But I don't see any reason why that shouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Could you target a customized version of Tomcat distribution? Um, <clears throat> so this is running as embedded Tomcat. Right. Um, by customized, I don't mean anything that turns on Docker stuff around. Yeah, yeah. So there, there is configuration uh, for Tomcat. Um, so for example, um, there is a there is um, a bunch of application properties. So if we go to um, so there's a bunch of things that you can configure easily uh, in Tomcat. Um, and I'll talk more about the properties configuration in a moment, but um, there, there are ways that, uh, like the common things that you tend to customize um, are exposed uh, as a starting point. You know, maybe you will find what you need there. Um, in addition to that, I mean, it's running as an embedded, uh, in embedded mode. So you can actually get access to the uh, Tomcat configuration APIs and you can do it that way too. Um, but essentially, you're running as a, as a, with, w in the embedded mode. So everything that's available to you uh, in embedded mode is, is basically what's exposed. Um, that probably means that you can't take, you know, configuration files, you know, the way you would run with a um, installation you know, outside. But you could also switch to the war, you know, mechanism and then just push into into that. But you know, the appeal is when you can run it, and you can easily switch back and forth, so you can do one thing in development and then another in production. So war wouldn't have the embedded Correct, yeah, war would be just the traditional war layout. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, um, so we did that. Uh, so going beyond uh, the getting started experience, is it about getting started? Um, well, the, the whole, again, remember that Spring Boot wasn't our invention. Uh, they were full stack frameworks like Drop Wizard that we drew inspiration from. And um, the whole idea there is, um, yes, it should be easy to get started, but ultimately the point is to run in production and it, it should have operational aspects and it should um, be helpful uh, at that level as well with um, exposing information about the running process by um, uh, helping you um, with um, security and other features that are related to uh, running in production. So for example, uh, you can add the Spring Boot uh, actuator. Uh, so let's go back to the POM. Spring Boot actuator. And I don't need to do any versions because all of that is uh, so Spring Boot, basically the auto configuration, it's Maven uh, dependencies are, are specified um, through the parent POM. Uh, so typically I just need to point to the dependency and that has all the uh, versions. So now if I run again, then uh, there are a variety of different endpoints that are exposed to me automatically. Uh, so I can do, uh, oops. Okay, unauthorized, did I, do I have? Yeah, that's probably, let me see here. Uh, Security. Yeah, so let's, um, full authentication required. Let's add Spring Security as well. Okay, um, so we're gonna do dependency, Spring Boot, Security, okay. And let's do that again. Um, and what this will do um, is I can configure the uh, users, uh, but it, it also, the default username is user, and I can take a password. So I can do this again, and this time I can enter security, and there is the uh, information here. So these are actually the mappings and um, um, uh, that are configured in the in the application by default. A lot of them happen to be uh, the endpoint uh, actuator uh, mappings. So uh, let's see slash info. Um, so let's take one here for web jars. So that's uh, one mapping um, slash error. So there's a variety of different, uh, so I can see all the mappings uh, exposed um, as metadata. I can also see, uh, let's see, what else here? Um, environment. Okay, so I can see information about the environment. Uh, so the, these things, um, the actuator endpoints uh, also expose a model uh, that allows you to create your own um, endpoints and you can um, accumulate some information and then expose it easily through this uh, same mechanism because clearly there are things that we can expose out of the box, but then there's others. Um, <clears throat> right, so security, we just saw that. There is a Spring Boot starter uh, for security and that brings in Spring Security with everything that you can do. Again, the idea is all of those things exist. Spring Boot is just providing a way to package it same way that you would, except you don't have to take those first steps. It's just available. Um, in terms of the configuration, um, so there is an application properties file. And that's um, in the resources directory. And in there is where you add your properties. Um, and there's a whole variety of properties. This is the first line of um, customizing the configuration. Uh, the first things you, you, you might go to um, is to go to the Spring Boot reference. And then for each integration, you will see 
different kinds of properties and things that you can configure. So uh, I can search on uh, Jackson, for example. Oh, all right. Right, so there's a whole bunch of uh, Jackson related properties. You will see, um, you know, it's all organized according to uh, the various integrations that are that are built in. Uh, so here is Spring MVC, for example, and there's a ton of things that you can do, you know, uh, to quickly tweak um, a thing or two, um, and it goes quite far uh, this way. Um, but as you can guess from this hierarchy, there's also a mechanism and you can plug into that mechanism uh, for configuration. Um, you can do things like type safe properties through at configuration properties. This is where you create a Java class that represents the properties that you're collecting. And then the fields in that class match to uh, the kind of the structure that you see here on the properties. Um, and because your uh, properties class is a Java class with actual typed objects, it will do the conversion. So it does, you know, fancy things like that, which are very, very convenient for um, creating your own uh, auto configuration and prefixed properties. And of course, each auto configuration has a bunch of these. Um, and after a while, you kind of get used to this way of thinking. And if you're doing something common and you think, well, uh, that could be a configuration property, then you can suggest it. And, uh, you know, the ones that appear here are the ones that are uh, very commonly used. So the way you would develop with Spring Boot is you would basically find the starter POM that you're interested in to see is there an integration for the sort of thing that I'm trying to do, whether it's Elasticsearch or, you know, uh, RabbitMQ, something like that. Uh, you would uh, check the documentation for the auto config, see what it says, uh, kind of how does it describe what it provides. You can see what properties are available to configure it. So you begin to experiment like that to see what it provides. Um, you can always go to the project, the underlying project, and see what it exposes. And so you, you kind of see what boot provides and what's available underneath. Um, you can also browse the auto configuration classes and see what's actually being done. And that's about it. I mean, it's not going to go generate code for you again. It's, um, this is what it gives you out of the box so you can be up and running. Um, in, for web applications, um, it's actually very important to work with static resources like HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Um, typically, these will be bundled um, in the executable jar. So again, we have an executable jar with everything in it. Um, and um, the slash star star, um, you know, from the very top uh, will be mapped to one of these different directories. So if I go into uh, my project, and under resources, I can create um, a directory called static. And I can begin to add here, um, you know, different static resources. And those will be available to be served uh, from the class path out of the box. Uh, there's also um, a web jars prefix. Uh, for those of you who know uh, web jars, this is basically uh, the easy <laughs> route uh, to managing versions of JavaScript libraries. There's a whole Maven repo with um, uh, different jars that bundle JavaScript libraries, and you can just use Maven uh, to manage those. Uh, so that's one way to do it. And basically, there's a convention here. So you do slash web jars, and then follow the convention of web jars, and it will find it on the class path and uh, get the resources from those jars. Um, but what you want to do very often is um, you want to run with Spring Boot um, uh, run, which gives you an exploded form, and that means that you get the development experience where you can just refresh in the browser and you see the updates to your JavaScript. Um, um, and also, another way to manage this is by using profiles. So you can say in development, I want to load from the file system, but in production, it's going to come from the class path. And the reason why this is very important is because um, if you're into managing um, your JavaScript, kind of doing it the way JavaScript developers do, uh, using, you know, NPM and, you know, um, uh, various kinds of tools that are available for JavaScript for minifying, uh, running with grunt and things like that, then it kind of makes sense to create a whole separate project. You know, um, the traditional way of putting things under source main web app, 
is very limiting when you start working with um, JavaScript tooling because that's a whole ecosystem in its own right with dependency management, generates a whole bunch of files, it downloads. It's the equivalent of having the entire Maven repo under source main web app. You don't really want that sort of thing. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can create a project for your client side development and that's where JavaScript developers will work. They can use NPM, they can use Grunt as a build system to do minifying, uh, use various kinds of plugins. And then you build that uh, with Gradle or Maven um, to prepare a jar with, with your JavaScript files and, and all the static resources. And then your main project, server project, depends on that jar. So in production, that's just available on the class path. But in development, with the development profile, you can switch and point the static resources to a file location. So it's just going you know, through the file system. And now if you make changes to your JavaScript files, they're not coming from the class path, but they're reloading um, as you would expect them to. So this is a really nice way of, of kind of dealing with um, static resources if, if you're uh, using JavaScript tools. But of course, if you're using something like web jars, mm, you know, then probably putting everything in your source main web app is, is good enough. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about DevTools, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so with DevTools, um, it's the experience where you, you, as you make changes, um, uh, those changes are reloaded. This is a very difficult problem in general. Um, I mean, you have tools like Zero Turnaround that provide you know, that kind of experience. Once your application is up and running, uh, when you make changes to your classes, how do you keep developing in the browser to see the changes? You make a change to a controller. Um, we've thought about, and there are some options, and Zero Turnaround has spent a lot of time uh, doing that, but it's, it's a huge amount of effort to actually replicate the experience of reloading things and making sure everything that you might expect works. And, you know, kudos to Zero Turnaround that they've done it, uh, but, you know, it's not easy to do that. And, you know, we've tried going down that path and it's not, um, it's very hard to guarantee that everything works. So basically the idea with DevTools is very, very simple. Um, if you make sure that the startup experience is very fast and you can do that by simply reloading the Spring application context in, instead of restarting the JVM and reloading all the classes, uh, then by and large, uh, most things will work. Um, it will simply reload um, in a new class loader uh, the relevant classes. Uh, so I can show you what that looks like. Um, let's stop this and uh, let's run. Oh, should I have imported? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're almost done. Um, so now if we go to localhost 8080 test, uh, hold on here, uh, name equals Pachicon. Uh, and I have to get this again from the, from the startup log, passwords. Okay, so once we're in, uh, so let's say we make a change to the controller. This is a very common thing. Let's say, uh, hello again. Um, of course, if I just reload here, it doesn't work, but um, in IntelliJ, um, and Eclipse works differently, and you can switch IntelliJ also, but you have to kind of recompile uh, the class. And once that's done, um, this is restarted here. Hmm. So it recompiled. Yep, that restarted Tomcat. Nope, something else is going on. Hmm. <laughs> um. 
I work with this all the time and now all of a sudden um, it works, believe me. Uh, anyway, um, the demo gods, <laughs> something. Um, but uh, basically the experience is that once you recompile a class, it detects it um, and, and it re restarts uh, the, the, the application. Um, and it's very quick and it's, um, you know, uh, very seamless. And you can also configure a live reload um, in your browser. So that connects through a WebSocket to the server. And when there is a change on the server side, you actually don't even have to, um, to do anything. It just kind of automatically tells it and, and the, the page refreshes in the browser automatically by itself. So really cool if you check out the, um, uh, that part of the reference in the Spring Boot documentation, you'll see, you'll see how it works. Yeah, question. Does it have the ability to fork another process at startup? Um, meaning? Developing front end stuff could be nice to take off the development tools for front end as well, like the Webpack and have that running. I mean, I'm doing it with me and then yeah. So, so why not just make that part of your build process um, and then, uh, as I was explaining earlier, just include it as a jar, you know, as a dependency. Right. So you, you basically build it on startup or during, during the package. Yeah, except the, trying to minimize the amount of effort needed by all the other developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that that should be achievable. That goal. It should be still a matter of running a you know a Maven command, and that should be up and running. But uh, I'm may, maybe I'm missing the the, the question. But um, you're still within Maven, so whatever you can do with Maven, you know, it's it's it's. So the boot run is I guess it is in Maven command. If you have a build plugin, that should still execute yeah. during the as, uh, during the phases of Maven, depending on what what command you're running. What phase does Spring Boot run run at? Um, and I realize I need to get out of the room, yeah. so um, let me free the stage. Thanks for coming to my talk. Okay.